When we considered Newton's laws of motion, we found that the net force on an object is the, op is the thing that dictates its motion. When we considered Newton's laws of motion, we found that it is the net force which determines the acceleration or the motion of an object. In the same way as we did for other contact forces or gravitational forces, we will expect that the electrostatic force or electrical force on a charge from a series of other charges will simply be the superposition of these individual forces from these other charges. There, as we said before, Newton's laws require that the total force acting on an object is the vector sum of the individual forces acting on the object. The only thing that we must consider here is that this force for the, the charges for electrostatic force is an action at a distance force. We must calculate this force vector using Coulomb's law. And if we wanted to know the net force on the charge little q, we have to compute individually force number one from charge number one, force number two from charge number two, and so on, all the way up to we reach charge number four for the four charges exerting a force on little q. We will get some practice calculating this net force due to a collection of neighboring charges. Let us consider the following example in which there will be three charges in each case but these charges will have different relative signs. Let us consider which of the charges in the middle feels the greatest force from its neighboring charges. And we will consider four cases, A, B, through C, and D. In each case, the charge in the middle experiences a force from the charge on the left and from the charge on the right. However, in choice A, the force on the middle charge is actually the largest. This is because the charge on the right is going to exert attra an attractive force over toward the charge on the right uh, on that middle charge. However, the charge on the left will also exert a charge on the middle charge, and it will be over toward the right because it will be a repulsive force. If the two charges on the left and right are equally distant from the middle charge, then these forces have equal magnitude, but in the same direction, and using the idea of superposition, these two forces add together to exert an overall net force, which is twice as large as the individual forces. If we look at the other possible choices, B, C, and D, then in the case of B, the left charge is exerting a repulsive force on the middle charge. It is pushing it over to the right. However, the right-hand charge is also exerting a repulsive charge on the middle and it's trying to push it over toward the left. The net force in this case is zero because these two, charge, these two charges being equidistant will also have an equal, and opposite, equal magnitude force just in opposite directions. As a result, the net force will be zero. If we consider answer C, the right-hand charge will be exerting an attractive force toward the right-hand charge on the middle charge. However, the left-hand charge will also be ex exerting an attractive force and trying to pull the middle charge over to the left. These two forces will cancel to zero and the net force will be zero. In the case of the right uh, answer D, the left-hand force will be exerting an attractive charge, attractive force over to the left, and the right-hand charge will be exerting an attractive force over to the right. Again, the net force here will be zero. So actually, A is the only answer in which there is a non-zero net force on the middle charge. Let us consider another example. Suppose a charge, little q, is located a distance capital R away from a th spherical shell, which has a uniformly distributed charge, capital Q, on it. What is the force on little q and the direction of this force? Well, this ball is somewhat confusing to consider because we've only considered charges until this time that are point charges, a little tiny ball. In this case, we have a charge, capital Q, distributed uniformly over the entire shell. In this case, it is helpful to consider the large charge, capital Q, 
is being divided into small elements, each element being located at different places around the ball. So let's consider a small element number one located up here near the top. It is located a distance r1 away from the charge little q. And there would be a force given by Coulomb's law, given by the product of the two charges, divided by the distance squared, and in the direction of r1. Likewise, if we consider another element of little charge, number two, down here at the, at the bottom of the ball, directly opposite number one, then it will exert a force given by Coulomb's law on the charge little q. It will be related to the, the vector r2, which points from that second charge over to charge little q, and it will exert a force f2, which points along that direction r2. If I consider f1 and f2, these are both vector forces, and they should add. The net vector force should point directly over to the right from these two because the upward component of f2 cancels the downward component of f1. I considered only two char charges or elements of charge here, number one and number two, but if I go all the way around the rest of the ball and take each little piece of charge, there is always an opposite little piece of charge on the other side, and each sum of those pairs of forces will always add directly over to the right. So that the net force on charge little q will actually equal the constant k times big Q divided by little q divided by capital R squared, where capital R is the separation between the center of the big ball and this charge little q. And the net force will always point along the axis between these, these two things, the big ball and the little charge q little q. If they have a similar charge, sign charge, then this will be a repulsive force. If they have an opposite charge, it will be an attractive force. The surprising thing we learn from this exercise is that the big ball of charge, capital Q, even though it is an extended object, behaves in Coulomb's law as if it was a point-like object. And we can estimate in many cases that the net force from between two objects, even if they are large extended objects, acts of, they act as if they are point objects located at the center of mass or center of gravity of those objects. This is a useful approximation in solving many of our problems. Let's consider a similar question. What about if the charge little q was located at the center of a big hollow uh, sphere with charge capital Q distributed uniformly over the ball? We can again divide the big ball into little elements of charge. Here's an element Q1. As it is located a distance r1 away from the charge of little q, it will exert a force f1 given by Coulomb's law, and it points along that radial vector r1. But likewise, there is an element of charge little q2, and it exerts a force that points along r2, and therefore cancels the force from f number 1. I can consider it all the way around the ball. I can take elements of charge 3 and 4, and these will exert equal and opposite charge, uh, forces, F3 and F4. And if I keep going all the way around the ball, I find that the net force, in this case, is just simply 0. For every sing single chunk of charge that might be exerting a force on the char charge little q, there is always a chunk of charge on the opposite side of the ball at the equal distance because we put the charge little q at the center. And this opposite side of charge will exert an opposite direction of force, canceling the, and canceling the initial force, and the net force will be zero always. Actually, this analysis extends to even the case where we put the charge off center of the big ball. To answer this kind of question, we again use the principle of superposition, and we considered the big ball of charge as the sum of lots of little pieces.